Welcome, everyone, to Intersection, where theology and practice meet. Uh, we're delighted today to have Dr. Chris Flanders with us. Chris, thank you for joining Randy and I. It's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you for inviting me. It's great. Looking forward to this conversation. I think the title of our time today is called The Return of Shame and Honor, and we'll want to figure out what in the world all of that's about uh, in due time. Uh, but first, just a few things about uh, some housekeeping here. Uh, welcome all again as you're settling in. Let us know where you're uh, signing in from uh, through the chat. Um, I'd also say to those of you who are participating with us today to not uh, to to utilize the Q&A feature in the bar at the bottom of your screen. That'll be the way in which you can ask Chris questions as we get a little further into our uh, program today. We'll use the Q&A session or uh, uh, button for questions. Use the chat feature to talk to one another in the room. We're looking forward uh, to seeing what uh, flows out of the chat and what kind of questions you may have as we get into our topic today. Uh, Chris, you're, you come to us, uh, you, you're part of the Graduate School of Theology faculty for a number of years now, but you started your professional life uh, in Thailand, uh, I think over a decade as a missionary there, and then on to do graduate work, uh, more graduate work and finish your doctorate at Fuller. You've been here for Oh, it's almost 20 years. Is that, am I, am I about right? I'm, I'm closer to 20 than I am at this, the beginning. It's 17 years I've been here. 17 years. Yeah. And of course your, your work continues to engage, engage with people thinking about missiology, but you're also a person who's involved and engaged with uh, churches and congregations, particularly as it speaks to questions about mission and uh, miss, missiology. And so we're just delighted uh, for you to bring your uh, experience to the table. In fact, the thing that prompted this was uh, uh, a book uh, that you and one of your colleagues recently wrote called Honor, Shame, in the Gospel. And I, I'll hold up a copy of it here today. I, uh, this is primarily for missiologists, but you, you and your colleagues are raising questions that I think are very germane to those of us who do ministry in uh, context right here in North America, and I hope by the end of this hour, we all can say, oh yeah, that's that's right. And uh, so I uh, appreciate so very much you taking time to be with us today. You're welcome. Well, I think what we'll do is, as we always do in this uh, session, is I'd like to take a minute of silence and uh, spend a minute in prayer, asking for God to be present in our conversation, and then we're going to jump in with some questions with Chris and and pursue this these these ideas of honor and shame and how they might speak into our lives. But let me ask you to join us in a, a minute of silent prayer as we attend to the presence of the Divine One in our midst. Eternal God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we acknowledge your presence with us in this space today and ask for your blessing, your wisdom, and your grace that we might hear, learn, and respond more fully to the work that you give to each of us in our place and location, that we might be found faithful servants. Use this time today we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, Chris, I, I'm I'm just curious. This idea of honor and shame as a as a lay person, as a per this is not my discipline, but when I think about that, I often think about missiology. And uh you spent time in 
Thailand doing mission work. You were trained and prepared for that kind of work, both here and at ACU, but then also your ongoing work at Fuller. Uh, how did you get interested in honor and shame? Did that come out of your mission experience or was that most, uh, did that come out of academic awareness or uh, tell us how you got interested in this topic? It started when I began to learn the Thai language as an intern, a short-term intern, when I was an undergrad student here. One huh. of the things about Thai language is that it's uh, complex with, uh, complexified by lots of honorifics mm. and uh, status terminology, especially the pronoun system. So just to use pronouns, as I like to tell my students, just to speak Thai, you have to make comments on your status of honorable or dishonorable your uh, interlocutor's status as honorable or dishonorable, you can't get away from that. And, hmm. and so that immediately started to uh, shake up my, you know, normal Midwestern English speaking world that I'd, I'd grown up in. Uh, but then it grew from there, of course. Uh, so yes, it's, it's, it's out of the context of working with people who think really differently about life, about society, um, and also then allowed me to read scripture a little bit differently. I saw things because of those cultural differences that, in particular, the area of honor and shame that I'd never seen before. So that opportunity gave me new lenses to read scripture, which then continued to help me think about how to, uh, to think and talk about these really important issues. But absolutely, it began with my engagement with the Thai culture. Nice. I guess thinking about that, our our sense is in American culture is that we live in this largely democratic kind of environment where uh, we don't think about hierarchy. Uh, but what you what you're describing sounds like when we encounter that. But it's not just about hierarchy. It's it has something to do with this these notions of honor and shame, right? Uh, uh, right. So so hierarchy just provides one avenue of honor and shame to be expressed. Right. There are so, multiple kinds. And so as we move into that, then what do we mean by terms like uh, honor and, well, honor and shame? And then sometimes we use the word guilt. And uh, so let's let's get some definitions out. What do we mean by, what do you mean by honor? What, what does that, what does that mean? Good question. Important question. Definitions are always critical. So honor. Our, our minds probably immediately go to certain forms of honor when we hear the word honor. They've been normed culturally. We've they've been stereotyped, or or they're powerful in our experience. Honor, really, though, is is a really big umbrella that is is about the expression of approval based on some evaluation of excellence. So you have to have a, a sense of excellence or virtue. And then you have to have a, a positive expression of some activity, some behavior, some status, some form of being in relation to that excellence. Okay. Um, and, and this can span incredibly diverse sorts of contexts and expressions. It's in athletics. It's, it's in academia. It's, it could be a moral thing. It could be a physical appearance thing. You could have standards of excellence of any kind. It could be in some contexts, blue eyes and blonde hair constitute what is honorable and therefore gets honoring, or it could be adherence to certain group standards, or it could be um, being ethical and, and full of integrity and doing work in a certain way. I mean, these are, it's just, uh, it spans all of, of, of human um, living. Um, it can be private, it can be public. Um, the emotion that we feel when we think about honor is the emotion of pride. Mm -hmm. which right. uh, is both what we might call hubris pride, the, the scholars call this alpha pride, and also the form of pride that we probably feel is legitimate, that sense of pride in doing a job well, or when your daughter or son does something excellent and you feel this sense of personal pride, mm -hmm. uh, which the scholars often call beta pride. Um, so that's, that's honor. Shame is an emotion that has to do with being defective, failing to live up or measure up, falling short. And this can be, again, uh, a result of uh, the, the eliciting event can be a community standard. It can be a sense of obligation. I'm not the kind of person that I thought I should be, so therefore I might feel ashamed. 
It could be something that's imposed on me from external. It could be my boss, Dr. Reed, who decides that I haven't done a good job and maybe notes that in some way, either privately or publicly. And I might feel a sense of not measuring up. Well, that's, of course, shame. Shame shows up in all kinds of ways, being dissed, being embarrassed, being humiliated, feeling stigma, feeling excluded. All of these things are in complex ways connected with this emotion of shame. So there's this thing kind of in American life now where we shame people. Uh, is doing that to somebody else the same thing as me feeling it or are those different things? Well, yeah, they, they can be different, Randy. It's a good question. So attempts to publicly or socially shame others can be met with different reactions. Some people are shameless and therefore are immune to shaming attempts. Um, but some people are exceptionally sensitive. I would assume that's not a, entirely a good thing. In general, in general, uh, even though in the West we have tended to think that we are past shame, we're not an honor shame culture. Maybe we'll talk about that. But in general, we do hold to the, the fact that that somebody who is shameless is not in a good moral shape, that their conscience is seared, that they're in, that they cannot feel shame. Um, we generally think that that's a bad thing, and um, yeah, so. Uh, social attempts to shame individuals can result in those individuals or communities feeling that shame, agreeing with or um, as, you know, agreeing with their assessment and therefore feeling it, or they could resist it. They could say, well, you're ridiculous. That That isn't even a thing, or your ideas aren't legitimate, and therefore I refuse to feel. But they still might suffer a form of social stigma. There might still be a price that they pay socially, even though they may not personally feel the emotion of shame. Well, so there's guilt, or excuse me, there's honor and shame. And well, I've got several questions here that are flowing through. One of them is, well, let me go ahead with this. And then I want to come back to, do we live in an honor shame culture in America today? We'll get to that in a minute. But right. honor, shame. Uh, but then there's this other word, guilt. And right. is shame the same thing as guilt or no? No, most uh, most social psychologists and those who study the phenomena of shame and guilt tell us that they're distinct, um, though sometimes overlapping experiences. One of the things that's really clear from the literature is that the same eliciting event can cause shame or guilt. So there's no such thing as a guilt cause and a shame cause. Those often co-occur, they can be the same thing. And one person may do the same thing as another person, but one person experiences guilt, whereas the other person experiences shame. And these are complex issues about personality and, and orientations and also social environment. But guilt generally is about infraction of some kind of code. We might even say breaking a law, for example. Guilt tends to focus more on the external event some like to say guilt is about, I did something wrong, and the focus is on that thing that I did. Whereas shame, so that's called specific attribution. I focus on this specific event, this specific thing that is external to myself that's out there, but I, I recognize I did it. Shame tends to be where I say, I did that thing, that thing was wrong, I'm wrong, I'm a bad person. In other words, it tends to come back and affect the self, whereas guilt often does not. Guilt is more of an abstract external thing that exists in the world, but doesn't necessarily touch the self, especially in the way that shame often does, which can be deleterious and global. Um, the attribution that you often get with shame is a global, I'm a bad person, I'm a failure. If anybody has ever felt that, right, I stink, I'm terrible, I'm a failure. Well, that's a global assessment. And that's a shame. Um, that's a shame uh, a function. So that they're different in that way, at least. Global or almost like sounds like existential. I mean, this is about yes. my very being. Right. right? And so quite frequently, uh, scholars will talk about um, shame as being an identity issue. Okay. And guilt rarely so. They're very different in other ways, too. They're solved completely differently. Um, guilt is often solved by uh, absolution 
and forgiveness. That takes, if, if you think of a loan as a sort of type of social uh, guilt, you know, I owe somebody something. If they forgive me of that debt, then I'm clear. Uh, similarly, if you've broken the law and you've either paid the fine or you've paid your time, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're no longer guilty, right? You, the guilt is gone. Uh, shame is very different. And shame actually is rarely solved by forgiveness because the shame self, it's, it's a much deeper, uh, as you said, existential and identity level kind of issue. So shame needs to be solved differently, typically by a, a, either a recreation of the self or renewed identity. And that's typically what helps people who feel the emotion of shame. So oh, take, take something simple, like if I have a student who cheats in my class um, and I'm fortunate enough to catch them, um, I... I want them to feel guilty about that. There, there's, there's something um, morally off if they don't feel any guilt about that. But do I want them to feel shame about that? That, that seems like that's more likely to go into a destructive uh, place. Or, or, or is shame an appropriate response to that? Or do I want them to feel guilt but not feel shame? How, how do you think about that? That's a great question. So uh, there are really two senses to guilt. <clears throat> One sense of, of what we, in, in English, and I'm here speaking only of English, mean when we say someone is guilty is we mean they did something, right? They're, they're culpable. So there's what we might call culpability guilt. The acknowledgement that, yep, you're right, I did it, as opposed to maybe denying that, no, no, I didn't cheat. Uh, wh what are you talking about? But someone who comes clean and says, yes, Dr. Harris, in fact, I cheated. The question then is whether that person goes another step and says, I did that wrong thing and I'm a cheat, right? They globalize it. I'm a bad person. I'm a bad student. I've failed God. I failed you. I have these uh, goals that I want to live up to and I've clearly fallen short of those goals. That would then lead a person to feel ashamed. Um, but the other part of guilt is just the, the emotion, right? To feel guilty about something. You can be guilty and not feel guilt, right? We all know people like that. You can be culpable, but not feel the guilt, feel guilty. You can also feel guilty about not actually doing anything wrong. So back to your question, do you want someone to feel shame? I think it's not trying to be evasive, but it depends. It depends on your goals. Um, perhaps we can talk about this, Paul regularly shames, and so does Jesus, opponents or people who are um, doing something that Paul, for example, considers to be especially harmful and uh, needing to uh, address in a significant way. So there, there are two different kinds of shame that, again, the scholars um, speak about, uh, I'm going to reference the scholars a lot because I'm, I'm, I'm into, into the literature, there's what's called disintegrative shame and reintegrative shame. Uh, sometimes people call this retrospective shame and prospective shame. And the difference is simply one looks, looks at the, what you've done and focuses on that thing and really tries to engender this deep feeling of being defective and awful and terrible and leaves it at that that there's no further telos, there's no other end. But there is this other type called reintegrative shame or prospective shame that Paul seems to be uh, using all the time, where the desire is the change in the individual or the reintegration of the individual back into a community. I, I was just thinking about prophet, I'm going, this is Old Testament stuff. So the prophet Nathan shows up and knocks on David's door, tells the parable, it seems like he's using shame to get at David's heart. Is that an? Is this this prospective shame working? Well, I'm I'm not in Nathan's mind, but I'm going to assume the best for Nathan, <laughs> and uh, that in fact, yeah, the desire is the change in David. But um, but you're absolutely right. If you go back and read that account, what what the word of the Lord that is given to David through the prophet says is, look at what I've done for you. Look at all, I mean, it sounds like a parent, right? 
I did this. I gave you everything. And you, you repay me with this. You do this. And that's classic shame language. Uh, so there's no doubt that the example that you've given, and you could multiply that by hundreds of examples throughout the, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, of a shame language used to evoke in a, peop, in a person, uh, a, stimulate their moral awareness and move them towards repentance, mm -hmm. at least in the best case scenarios. That's good. Yeah. Well, uh, so honor, shame, guilt, we're getting some definitions out here floating around. Uh, there's one more, and then I want to make a turn. I want to, what I want to ask is, are we, do we live in a shame based culture here in, a, in the United States? But there's another term that sometimes gets in these conversations and I have a hard time locating it. So help me out. The term face, uh, face sometimes shows up in these conversations. So locate that, help us with our map here. Well, that's actually my, my my specific expertise is in what's called face and face work theory. So this is right okay. up the alley. Um, so face face is a social phenomenon, and and we all this is the interesting thing. All of us, if you're human and if you're in society, uh, I think even a hermit by themselves would do face in a certain way, either between themselves and God or with within their own self conversation. Uh, but it's it's the ways that we configure our social identity in social space, which is an honor and shame, potentially honor and shame laden activity. So things like introductions, you introduced me, I believe you did as Dr. Flanders. Um, what, that's an honorific. And the face theorists would say, you, you gave me face. You played to my face by addressing me a certain way in, in public. You didn't have to, you could have called me Chris. You could have called me Flanders. You could have called me something horrible, right? Um, you chose not to. Uh, you sensed a certain fa appropriate face valence and you chose a term that represented your ideas uh, that consisted with that. So face is a complex social phenomenon that exists in every culture. Uh, though some cultures, like many in Asia and the, the Mediterranean, will lexicalize these, they will put them in language in a much more clear and explicit way than we do here. Here we sublimate it, kind of hide it under things like politeness and forms of respect and opprobrium. Um, we, but we do the, the face thing all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's about social identity in social space and how we negotiate that. And, and um, yeah, the yeah. normal part of human existence. That's good. All right. So, and that plays into this conversation because we're either uh, ascribing honor or favor, or we can be um, uh, ascribing sh or uh, fostering shame by the, the kinds of ways in which we're interacting with one another, right? I'm, Absolutely. I'm we, we do it all the time. Okay. Yes. Now, here's here's the question I keep saying I'm going to ask, so I'm going to ask it finally, and that is, when these conversations about honor and shame, uh, again, I'm a lay person, but I remember taking my my missions course in, in seminary 40 years ago, uh, and in hearing about honor shame uh, a bit, um, but it was sort of like that's what other cultures do you know, other places. But I'm getting the sense, uh, and this is where my question comes, that actually uh, all cultures tran uh, transact or live with honor and shame. It's just that we do it in in, in different sorts of ways, um, or or we, we've ignored it, or we've not paid attention to it or something. So talk to, talk to us here. Is this conversation about honor and shame playing itself out actually in our own context here in, in the United States and in the West. Right. Well, I, I, I think so. I mean, what I, what I often do to just kind of get into this conversation is to ask people I'm talking with, have you ever uh, clapped? You know, have you ever given somebody a shout out? Have you ever dissed somebody um, or what we, uh, there's a new form called doxing. Um, have you, you know, undressed somebody publicly, not literally, of course, but have you, in other words, we, like we just mentioned about face, 
we're engaged in these practices all the time. We, we, and here I'm speaking about us in the, in the Western world or even the, the more specific Anglo-American English speaking world. Uh, and you're right that we've often essentialized what we think of as honor and shame and projected that on these other cultures, whether that's the cultures of Southern Europe, the Mediterranean, East Asia, Southeast Asia. You're, you're absolutely right, Carson. Uh, in fact, I've written about this in several places. Uh, there is no such thing as honor shame cultures. If if we mean by that some qualitatively distinct kind of culture that has this thing honor shame, whereas other places don't, mm -hmm. all human cultures are have honor shame dynamics and they have face dynamics. And the more important question is to is to pay attention to those specific dynamics and to ask how they differ from other modes. And of course, there are lots of ways that these lots of valences in all of these practices. But I think it's fair to say that uh, there's a long, complex uh, history that mostly comes to us through anthropology and then is reified in other important ways like missiology, where prominent missiologists would talk about honor, shame cultures versus guilt, innocent or uh, justice cultures. Those designations, I think, um, and I'm pretty sure that I'm right. Uh, are arbitrary and unhelpful and ask and actually mask, uh, distract us from the really important honor shame dynamics here, but also guilt dynamics in places like Japan or Thailand or um, Southern Greece. So yeah, does that yeah. help? Do, I, I'm wondering, do the forms of uh, ordinary discourse uh, make a difference here. And, you know, for instance, if I'm if I'm trying to get somebody's attention whose name I don't know, I'll always call them sir or ma'am. Right. Or if if I'm in an airport and offering a seat to somebody who's older than me, that population is getting smaller and smaller. But <laughs> you know, I'll say, sir, sir, do you want? Um, but in in my own classes, I always told my students I didn't mind if they called me by my first name, that I didn't consider that disrespectful. Now, I'm just wondering if those ordinary manners of discourse actually make a, a difference. I know in, in, in Singapore, because of my age, the number of people will call me uncle, uh, uh, Randy. What, what, um, what, do, what do those do to us? So you've hit on uh, one, one of the major cultural dynamics that influences the practices of what we would call honorification or, or even shaming. Um, yeah, it, to your uh, original example, if you see somebody, uh, you don't know their name and you shout, hey, you. OK, we might consider that to be inappropriate, a little disrespectful. And there are probably shameful ways that we could also. Uh, you down in the front, sit down, you know, those kinds of attempts at shame. Um, hierarchy, so power distance and how it plays out versus a more flatter egalitarian ethos, we're all the same. Those cultural commitments are going to shape how we do these practices uh, and engage in them. Um, but we still do uh, because the flatter egalitarian mode still creates groupings. And one of the things that honoring and shame dynamics connect to is insider outsider experience or what. Uh, Miroslav Wolf might call exclusion and embrace. And those practices, are you in or are you out? And how we demarcate those boundaries of social units. Typically, uh, uh, accrue within them various forms of honorification language. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm wearing, as is Randy, wearing proudly our tribe um, logo here, right? Our ACU designated attire. Apparently, Dr. Reed didn't get the memo. And uh, he failed here. But this designates us as a special kind of person, or at least somebody who can afford an expensive shirt. I guess you don't have to work at ACU to get these, but mine was a gift because I'm a faculty member here. And there, so faculty forms a certain kind of a community that gets honored in certain ways and designated in certain ways. Even among faculty, we typically not, I don't call you Dr. Harris or Dr. Reed when we talk with one another. We're Chris, Randy. Carson. Um, so yeah, there are other complex social commitments 
that will influence those practices. So absolutely. So I'm thinking about kind of moving this into, so if we live in a, if the culture we inhabit does does have honor shame is intricately bound up in it and you're saying no culture is without that it's just that we it manifests itself in different ways right. um that starts to open up the door and uh, a lot to think about some of the stuff that we see as ministers and congregations or in our uh, in the in the environments that we uh, attend to I, i'm just thinking about um it's not uncommon if you're in ministry in a local church to be sitting with people who are experiencing, now using this new language you're giving us, not just guilt, but also shame. Uh, the, these are the people that I'm preaching to when I'm preaching in a church on a Sunday morning, right? So uh, unpack that a little more. Talk about this a little more theologically, right. uh, Professor. Let's, let's move into some of that kind of space. And, and as I'm getting into the, the biblical theological dimensions here, I would recommend two important books. I think I've provided these to Renee. That one is called The Hope of Glory. It's by New Testament scholar David De Silva. And he discusses beautifully how this plays out, especially in the New Testament. And the other is a recent book by New Testament scholar uh, Tay Lee Lau, who is a Singaporean. And uh, the book is called Defending Shame, Its Formative Power in Paul's Letters. Mm -hmm. So these are two books that I would strongly recommend if anybody wants to pursue this further. Um, but of course, by the book you held up before, right? I need my Google uh, rankings to go up a little bit after this webinar. So um, yeah, there it is right there. <clears throat> Theologically, uh, if, if you read scripture and if, and if you think about it, I mean, shame erupts at the very beginning, right? Because if you read the, the sin of Adam and Eve, there's there's absolutely uh, strong evidence there that that the way that 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 old, that initial encounter with sin um, is discussed in a way that is is shame laden, right? The the experiences that they have of realizing their nakedness, which you could interpret both literally but also metaphorically, that their own kind of exile now uh, rebellion against God has brought them into a state of vulnerability and, and shame, shameness or shame prone living, but also the fact that they tried to hide and they covered things up. These are classic examples of shame. Uh, so from the very beginning, it seems that they've exchanged the honor of God, this glorious uh, existence that God had created for them and the privilege of naming animals and creation and, and tending the garden. God's representatives on earth, uh, they've now exchanged for, uh, and, and experienced the shame. And then the exile that happens as they're, as they're uh, ex, you know, moved out also is a shame-laden experience of being cast out. So one of the things that I picked up in Thailand in, in so many ways, I couldn't even begin to, to speak about it, but I remember one particular moment when in doing evangelism, one of our recent converts noted about his uh, initial uh, contact with the Christian community he said, um, we came, I came back a second time and you remembered my name. I'm a nobody. And, and this whole community remembered my name. And although I'm poor and nobody, you embraced me like I was a person. And he attributed his movement towards God and openness to learn about Christ specifically to that affirmation that he experienced as part of a community. I think that's one place to start, is if you read the New Testament, you see, especially in Paul's letters, but also in Jesus, uh, this strong sense of affirming who we are in this new space that we occupy, if we want to call that salvation, mm -hmm. or Paul's language of being in Christ. But that new place is a place of incredible honor because we're not only adopted as children of the high God, but even more, he gives us his very own spirit to live within us and also within the community. So for, for many people in places like Thailand, they read these kinds of, of, of uh, acclaims and they get this incredible sense of esteem and, and uh, a sense of self that's developed out of the honorification that they've experienced now being a part of God's people. Uh, you once were 
you know, no people, but now you are a people, right? You were, you were lost, but now you're found. Um, and so theologically, I think that we can see this distinct becoming somebody, uh, honorification that happens as we are adopted in the family of God. Um, in terms of shame, we better pay attention to it because as Andy Crouch noted in a 2016 uh, long article in the journal Christianity Today, which I believe was called The Return of Shame, and I would encourage anybody who's got online access to Christianity Today to go find that article and read it. Um, some of the new modes of communication, in particular, uh, he highlights two things, social media, the rise of social media, but also the polarization of our society into new tribes, political tribes, social tribes. And those two phenomena together are producing a new wave of shame experiences that are the members, people who are sitting in our pews, people who are our leaders, people who are our staff and ministers are experiencing. And, um, and so this new wave of overt shame experience is something powerful that is now present that we should um, should pay attention to. And, and we're blessed because scripture talks about this. The, right. one who trusts, the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and other ways of honoring people. So, uh, so as ministers, as pastors and churches, as, uh, so how paying attention to these dynamics of honor and shame uh well just to put a footnote here what i'm hearing in here is sort of we go back and reread the bible right if we, we go back and reread the bible we'll find ourselves living in, in uh thinking about texts themselves in some very different ways it seems but having said that back to my question um how do we attend how do we attend to that and how do we when we encounter shame uh with a person or we find that in our congregational context what is the pastoral move that we make right. how do we attend to sh the questions about uh, when we encounter persons who are bearing shame right. um, it's different than guilt it is guilt yep. I, as you said i think you said this earlier that's more of uh you know uh forgiveness is a part of that right this uh yeah uh, absolution of guilt but shame is a little different animal so help us it, out it, so i think pastorally there are several important moves that we can make and and one cuts right back to what you just pointed out carson um I, it was a recent book uh that the title was if i'm forgiven why do i still feel so terrible <laughs> and i would say though I, again i'm not in the author's mind uh that the answer is shame yeah, you're forgiven. But shame is a different animal. And, and so attention to the dynamics of shame and how that can be prevalent in a congregation or in people's lives is, is really critical. Um, now, there, there are toxic forms of shame, no doubt. I, I, I'm not an apologist in, 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 in unlimited sort of ways without qualification for shame. I'm not here advocating shame. Um, and people like Brene Brown and, and many others draw our attention appropriately to those toxic forms of shame. Shame. The other thing about shame is that you tend to hide. Shame tends to push people to hide. So it's not always easy to, to, to call out and to address, um, which is itself a pastoral, uh, an issue of discipleship that we have to uh, attend to. But um, one of my friends, Warner Mishka, who actually is the co-editor of that book with me, he says we have we have twin pastoral dynamics we must attend to that come from come from uh, scripture and from uh, kind of theological resources. For Christians, we should lean deeply into honor surplus, which is his way of talking about what I mentioned a little bit ago of this incredible amount of glorious, wonderful, affirming, life giving, awesomeness. Um, and, and one thing I didn't mention is that honor, the experience of honor tends to fill us and shame tends to be a depleting experience. And the other thing he says next to honor surplus is shame resilience of becoming aware of the trickerations that shame 
uh, uses. And here I have no problem in uh, assigning some of that to our enemy who loves to catch people and, and keep people in, in, in a shame mode. Uh, shame can be so destructive and uh, it leads people to even commit suicide or to withdraw from faith in God or community. Um, and there are a lot of things that we can do. Uh, we can pay attention to the, um, importantly, what we praise. Because giving credit or pointing out excellence publicly is a form of honorification. So what do we praise? Uh, do, we, do we always make mention of the promotion at work and the national merit finalists in our congregation? These different kind of either educational or business excelling. Not that those things are, aren't excellent. They are, and they are probably worthy of praise. But one of the things you see in the New Testament is a, a radical shift in the honor codes upon which New Testament communities practices of honor and shame should occur. And this is De Silva's point. Do we highlight those things that now in the community of the crucified one now constitute real honor and now constitutes real shame? Those things that we formerly thought were awesome and great. Paul says, now you're ashamed of those things and you should be. And, and, and things that you used to think were weak and beggarly and ridiculous, now these are the honorable things. And do we paint that kind of contrasting picture clearly in our preaching and in our discipleship, our teaching, where we're honoring appropriately the right things? So what do we celebrate in church, in families too? How do you celebrate? What do you give uh, recognition to? And, uh, and what do you draw attention to as shameful? This, this act of pastoral cultural interpretation, I think, is right at the heart of addressing, um, not the only way, but a significant way that uh, congregations can, can work with this. I'm uh, uh, following the Q&A as you're going along, and you've largely answered uh, one question we got. The, the second one that came in, I think it's really interesting. Um, honor and shame seems to be based on an acceptable standard that is ubiquitous. What about our current society where shame is based not necessarily on a ubiquitous standard or a shared one, but competing standards and yeah. preferences? Is, is what you just said, is that the way you kind of address that? You allow uh, the biblical witness to define the standards of honor and shame in a, um, in a community because it, it doesn't seem as clear. The, 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 um, the consensus on that is not as clear as it might have been. And maybe it was never that clear in the 1950s, but it's, it, it doesn't seem to be as clear today. Yeah, so uh, I think in any culture that has a, a large number of professing Christians, such as our North American culture or, or society, yeah, you're going to find uh, consistency between, on the one hand, what we might call the biblical uh, honor codes and societal honor codes, that there, there is a, a connection or an overlap there to the extent that you might not find in a place like Thailand, where I lived and worked for 11 years. Uh, and and societies have been flow. Yeah, you're right. We probably shouldn't over romanticize the 50s so much because there is a lot of um, things that we called honorable that we now should consider shameful <laughs> in our broad culture and vice versa, perhaps. Um, I think of things like disability, right? We've all now come to grow to really appreciate how people with disabilities shouldn't be excluded or made to feel second class. Those are all shame uh, experiences, but rather celebrated and, and affirmed. So yeah, um, I think what you find is as, as any culture ebbs and flows and shifts and changes that there's going to be greater or lesser disconnect or connection with what we might consider to be biblical canons, um, virtues, right? I always go back uh, to the fruits of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5 as one great way of, of pointing to a different kind of honor code, that these things are now honorable, and, and laying down 
uh, our, our lives for another is honorable and taking the low way of humility, which you, I don't think that you can find any culture throughout history that as a culture has celebrated humility publicly. All cultures throughout history, all human cultures celebrate hubris, um, if sometimes muted, but still um, people who are proud and who are strong and who have exuding forms of confidence. Um, that's what people like in general. And here you have both Jesus and Paul and other authors celebrating the opposite of taking the lowest position of recognizing others above ourselves. I mean, this is as countercultural as you're going to find. And so you're always going to have that um, friction, I would sus suspect, uh, with prevailing cultural modes of honor and shame. One of the things you see in the New Testament, I'll end here, is this uh, process of sometimes affirming, because not everything that our culture gives us is wrong, affirm, uh, to tweak or even subvert, and sometimes to reject. And so one of the theological tasks for any church in any age in any culture or subculture is to do and to investigate what of those three activities we need to do towards the dominant cultural modes of honoring and shaming. Do we adapt and say, that's good. We like that. Um, that's appropriate and, and God honoring or mm, kind of a little bit, maybe a little tweak here and there, or maybe we'll have to twist it. Or do we just simply say, we do not do that kind of thing. And of course, that's a, a big theological job for any church, any church plant, uh, any congregation. You know, I th thanks, Chris. I, I Just a, a shout out here to our, our community, to our participants. Uh, if you've got a question, pop it on into that Q&A. We've uh, been working off of some questions sort of on the sly here in these last seven or eight minutes. But um, uh, so I invite you to ask your questions. Um, and we've got a few more minutes here before we're going to wrap up. But uh, Chris, it occurs to me thinking about cultures, we think about the culture we inhabit and its swiftly shifting dynamics, a growing polarization in our culture that's playing in. I also think about the culture in congregations. Every congregation has its own particular, I call it DNA, uh, that is present. What are some ways in which, um, I'm, 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 we could talk about our culture, but I, I think I'm going to push toward congregation here with this question. Uh, how do how do we cultivate as ministerial leaders healthy a healthy culture of the healthy use of honor and and shame and uh, what are some pathologies that sometimes find themselves in churches that we need to find a way to sort of bleed off or uh, attend to uh, or maybe we need to get a surgeon saw out and cut uh, as if we could that that's gets us into, you know, how, how do, how do organizations kind of shift and change, but am I, am I raising something there? I've kind of got nebulous there with my question, but talk to us a little bit about the cultural context of congregations and honor and shame, and how do we foster pastoral leadership again? How do we foster healthy dynamics? Right. Well, like I mentioned earlier, one of the first steps, I think, is, is to pay close attention to what we draw attention to. So what we publicly set up, which is a form of honorification, right? What, what do we honor? How do we honor? What are the modes of our honoring, giving shout outs, giving praise, whether that's announcements or whether that's the way that we affirm people in uh, different roles, who is included or excluded? Uh, of course, one of the most profound ways that people experience shame in any culture or subculture is exclusion from a desired community. And, um, and whether it's intended to shame them or not, people often experience shame. So where, where are the dynamics of honor and shame happening in any co congregational culture at the moment? And then I would... Um, so it's kind of a congregational cultural exegesis. This is what I encourage my uh, students who are going to do church planning in other parts of the world, other cultures, is to walk down a kind of a list of um, a, a cultural exegesis, particularly in relation to honor and shame issues. And so there are all kinds of 
questions that you can ask to bring those things to the surface. The, the other thing I would say is, and that's the key, is that these things need to be, uh, the things that are hidden need to be made clear, right? The things that are implicit need to be made explicit. And then we can ask questions about those things. And I think that a lot of times why this escapes us as a pastoral task is because we often don't think about ourselves as an honor shame subculture or an honor shame being. But if I'm right, we are all this, and therefore our congregations are all this, and any subculture, congregational culture has to, to exist, um, have forms of virtue that they extol and approve of, which immediately produces honor, and also immediately produces categories of what we might call shame, uh, exclusion, uh, wrongness. And so to pay close attention to those practices, those are sometimes verbal, rhetorical, sometimes they're organizational, and um, and to ask questions, are we happy with this? Um, and uh, and also to assume, as, as you noted, that our members are being influenced by our surrounding broader culture. Right. So to pay attention to those dynamics that you noted is really critical, especially today. Um, and especially with the rise of social media and how powerfully shaming that can be also. Randy? Well, uh, it's, it's an interesting problem, right? To extol humility is to destroy that which you extol. Um, how, how do you? How do you do that? So th there's a great divide in Christian history, and it at least dates back to Augustine, who viewed, it's ironic, actually, if you read Augustine and his conversations about this, uh, he will talk about the, the dangers, the poisonous, ruinous character of praise, all the time praising. <laughs> uh, so it, it's really inescapable. You know, you think about Paul's call outs or shout outs in Philippians, right? Timothy, I've got no one like him. And what's Paul doing? He's honoring, he's, he's, he's praising Timothy, which is a form of honorification. Epaphroditus, there's no one like that guy uh, to set the table for this kind of selfless, self-giving uh, point that Paul is, is trying to make. So I don't know that I would say that uh, praise is inherently and always ruinous. It, you have to watch it uh, because it's easy, like, I don't know, like dessert at Thanksgiving to just completely overdose, right? And, and leave feeling, oh, um, and so Augustine's point is is warranted that this is a this is a radioactive kind of chemical, but there are appropriate ways to handle radioactive material that don't uh, that can be used for good and and not for ill. So the attention to what you're praising and how you're praising, and um, I think I think that uh, you can see this clearly in Scripture. Uh, otherwise, we just better stop congratulating and, um, you know, pointing out positives of, of all people. There was, as you I'm sure know, because you're a historian and a philosopher, uh, in certain kinds of early Puritan spirituality, this very thing that you would, you would, you would wear dull colors, that you would never engage in things, you would never call, uh, that would bring uh, much joy, you would, um, you would never draw attention to distinctions or excellence in any kind for fear that it would create this this kind of hubris that is dangerous and and absolutely unchristian and and unchristlike but um they continue to do it even though they railed against it and that's the thing is it seems that it's something that we can't completely do without so we got to figure ways of doing it well and doing it humbly and, and in godly forms hey. We're moving toward the end, but I've got one quick question for you, Chris, and then we'll wrap up. Um, you you named this earlier, and I made a note, and I want to come back, but you kind of said it and then kind of moved on. Um, you talked about some, you used the word resilience, which is a, a word that is a, a live thing for me. Uh, 
and I think you said shame resilience was okay. the language. So just real brief, how would we foster shame resilience, particularly in this environment, the environment that we're living in now? Yeah. Uh, not that it's unique. Christian people have been lived in harsh climates before, but talk about shame. Re- what do you mean by shame resilience? It's a term that has come into modern vocabulary through the works of Brene Brown. She herself uh, stole it from the social psychologists. But uh, what we mean is developing the capacity in our souls, in ourselves, to resist the the negative impact of of either shame attempts from the outside or our own shame voices from the inside. Um, and anybody who's ever struggled with uh, either addictions, which my wife, who is a therapist, tells me at the root of most addictions is some kind of shamed self, um, mm. though maybe some people are genetically prone towards that, but still this sense that I'm I'm worthless, I'm a failure, I can never get it right. Um, so shame resilience is developing the capacity to tell the truth to in 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 direct uh, resistance to those voices. And here's where we fall on scripture and on the truths about ourselves in Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is not something that you can solve in a weekend seminar, as we all know, who've worked with people who struggle with these things. For many of us, I'll raise my hand here, this is a lifetime journey to continue to affirm and, and to be reminded of, sometimes in kind of ritualized ways, sometimes in personal sorts of ways, um, ad hoc ways of who I am in Christ and how much God loves me. Now, there's a particular type of theology that has a problem with this, that sees the self as ultimately a kind of greasy worm and a horrible sinful, and it's really pretty lucky that you even have found the grace of God. And, and, and so that particular kind of theology is always in danger of being drugged back into the shame experience. So once theological anthropology is going to shape the extent to where we're going to be vulnerable or we're going to be able to to resist that, but um, developing the capacity to to take on those messages with God's truth Mm -hmm. and a a renewed reminder of who we are in Christ and a community helps. So it's not just between the solitary individual and God trying to sort this out in their own soul but also a community who embraces, who affirms, who approves, who loves, who cherishes, who honors. Uh, If you can get those two things together, you've got a strong chance of developing shame resilience against both external shame factors as well as the internalized forms. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Hey, we're we're coming down to the hour. I want to, Randy and and Chris, I'm going to ask you one more quick give us your 30 second sort of here's the leading thought this is the as i reflect back over this past hour what would you want to reiterate to our uh community here today our our participants what would be that one thought i'll come around and ask you that randy and then chris um but while i'm giving them a moment to think i want to thank you as our participants for being a part of this and remind you that our next uh intersection event is on november the 15th uh, November 15, I've got that written down somewhere. Yes, at 11 a.m., Dr. Jennifer Schroeder will be with us. Uh, Jennifer is a uh, person who's done a lot of work with uh, children's ministry, and we're going to be talking about children. We're going to talk about ministry with children uh, on November 15th, and you'll want to be a part of that as you think about the the role and the place that children have in our congregations. Um, we, and we have one more in December. Uh, we'll talk about soon. That'll be on preaching. You'll not want to miss that as well. Registration is, uh, we're getting ready to bring you in to register. I see it. Renee has posted something there to get you linked up for that. Um, okay, Randy, I, I want, what, what would be the leading thought as we wrap up here today? What would you say? Uh, well, I don't think it's the leading thought, but the one that created the most guilt in me. <laughs> um, Remembering somebody's name is an act of love and respect. Absolutely. And we can make lots of excuses, and my memory's not as good as it once was, but, but you know, those, those small acts of love and respect and recognition 
that we're called to in the body of Christ uh, really do count for something. And I think I need to be more attentive uh, to those and 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 to make sure that I honor the virtues that we claim as in the upside down uh, kingdom. I think um, I think that's a great way to think about our um, our work. Thanks, Randy. I appreciated Chris's story about uh, in his mission time in Thailand of the the fellow who came. Yeah, thank you, Chris. How would you? What would be your takeaway here? What would you leave us with? Um, always do webinars with honorable uh, panelists to make you look good. That's one thing. Uh, thank you for that. I think I'd come back to the point for this audience, I suspect in my mind is, is most important. Honor shame is not an out there, them, odd, weird culture issue, set of issues. It's an us set of issues. And uh, maybe that's becoming increasingly clear in our current context, but churches today need to pay more attention. Uh, there's some great literature out there that we've often thought is just for the missionary types, but really does have a lot to say to congregational contexts here in North America, especially as the diversification of our congregations increases. This mm -hmm. will become more and more the case. As subcultures, Latino, African-American, Asian-American, often have played with uh, an honor shame game that resembles more of uh, overseas context than our own Anglo American. And so we need to learn about those different modes as is there even Anglo American context shift and change. That's good. Well, Chris, again, thank you for your time with us today and for sharing. Uh, Chris has been working with Renee. Some, some things have been posted. I think Renee will be following up with more reading resources in this area. Uh, so be looking for that. So Chris, thank you. Randy, we'll come to you and let you offer a, a good word, a benediction to close out our time. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. To him who's able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.